Welcome to another edition of Just Read It, our brief but spectacular book review of New York Times bestsellers. Today we have local artists <clears throat> that are going to help us discuss The Ninth Hour by Alice McDermott. And uh, we want you to pitch in and, and uh, see if you agree with our assessments. Now, my guest to the right is Eric Witchy, who is a local writer. Eric, just what's your latest book? What are you doing? Uh, this is the latest. This is Littlest Death. Um, it is the story of the youngest Grim Reaper, who is only allowed to pick up the souls of paramecium and one-celled animals. But she does it by the millions, because she has a bucket. And, uh, but one day she wants to grow up and do human souls. And of course, when she finally gets the chance, things go horribly wrong. Um, it's the winner of the International Book Award for Visionary Fiction, and it was a Silver Award winner in the Independent Publishers Book Award for Fantasy. Uh, I call it an afterlife fantasy, but um, the company that paid me to do it calls it a labyrinth of souls novel. It's a labyrinth of souls novel. Yeah, it's because the company has a card game. They hired it done. I see. And it's a card game. The picture on the cover is actually a card from the game that they did. Well, that'll work in with the, the ninth hour for sure, because we're talking about soul there. Well, I, I went uh, to Catholic school. Okay, so and then you know, we'll, I'm, we'll I'm make in. you an expert. All <laughs> we'll right. have fun. My next great guest is Jane Greenbaum, who is an extraordinary poet and has not published a book yet, but is on the verge. What are you, what are you, what are you working on, and what's the title? The title of my book is Boiling My Tongue. It's from a poem that I wrote a while ago called Boiling My Tongue. And uh, the book is finished, essentially. I just have to organize it into sections, and that seems to have stopped me dead in my tracks. I can't get excited about doing that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the artist and the organizer sometimes right. don't mix, right. do they? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I have read Jane's poem, so when the book comes out, bite your tongue if you don't buy it. Um, okay, we're going to talk to Eric when he's with us. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. I'm just turning on my book. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, the book, as I said, is Alice McDermott's Ninth Hour. Ninth Hour means the, the hour of Christ's death. And... Um, it's a Catholic background story of nuns. I wonder, perhaps, Eric, would you would you mind telling us what you think and stop reading your cheat notes? Well, it's it's a very dense <laughs> book. It is a dense book. I mean, there there are three generations of people. Mm -hmm. There are uh, levels of suffering that are established. There's relationships between dogma and the church, faith in the church, and spirituality. There's a, a running theme of of the relationship of family and friends versus the relationship of the concept of sin, um, you know, self-sacrifice, sacrifice for others. Uh, it is a very dense book, so I took notes. <laughs> <laughs> We're fool you. We kind of wing it around here. <laughs> well, one of the things that really fascinated me about the book was um, I had a, a teacher who was a nun who was mm -hmm. called Sister Francis Savior. Mm -hmm. And so there's, the book starts out with Sister Savior, and Sister Savior sort of sets the tone for the moral ambiguity of dogma versus personal spirituality. And, and just briefly for, the, for our audience, how does, how does she do that? Oh, well, the, one of the characters, Annie, has a husband who the book opens with the suicide. He kills himself. He's lost his job. He's clearly not made for working in the world that he's living in. And uh, he ends his own life. And the sister is literally walking home. And she sees a commotion and she goes in and she interprets it as God's will, taking her to this place to give succor to the suffering. And she sees what has happened, she realizes it's a suicide, and she immediately begins to um, engage in machinations to make sure he's buried in consecrated ground. Right. Um, which is, of course, a sin on her part, but that doesn't bother her too much because she can see the suffering of the family and the problems that will create. And So she's really trying to help these people, uh, and she fails. Mm -hmm. And that sort of launches the, it launches the themes, it launches the character lines, it launches the base families for the stories. And it um, launches so much grief. It does, <laughs> and, and an endless Jane, stream of grief. what did you think? Uh, I love that <laughs> book. I really did. In fact, I read it twice. I'm a reader. I, I read continually. 
Um, I thought it was beautifully written, and I love the characters. She fills her characters with so much life. You can see them. You can hear them, you know. Um, and I'm sort of interested in the Catholic background. You said you went to Catholic school. I was a Catholic school principal. Oh. <laughs> and I'm not Catholic. <laughs> But at any rate, uh, I had some experience then, and I had a number of friends who were nuns who did wonderful things. Mm -hmm. So this book touched my heart. It really is a good book. Um, I love the fact that she made, you know, she took the risk of writing about nuns. Because McDermott. Uh -huh. That is a risky mm -hmm. subject matter. And it starts with a suicide and yes. ends with a murder. Yes. And I... I thought that was really interesting. This is not your normal beach read, is it? You know? No, it isn't, but it's, I found it a really pleasantly easy read, you know. She has a very great writing style that you can just flow right through it. Mm -hmm. uh, what did you think about her style? Well, stylistically, she's a poet. Um, the, way that she, the way that she represents character in setting is poetic. So she'll establish the subjective interpretation of setting from a character perspective. But then she'll bring in objects, individual items that establish the history of everyone who's been in that, that setting. Um, and that's, uh, that's objective correlative. She's taking these objects and correlating them to emotional and, and historical states for the families. And so by having a character walk into a room, you don't just experience the character walking into the room, you experience the character walking into the history of an entire family. This is true. And that is a powerful, powerful set of techniques at work. I mean, this is, this is a master writer applying craft, and, and there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Um, I'm not sure that there was a murder. I, I, yes, I, there was. I know, oh. I know, <laughs> but I got to the end, and, and um, uh, Sally gives Mrs. Costello the tea and helps her drink it, but she never stirs the alum in. No, oh, she didn't do the murder. <laughs> the, I, Sister Jean did. Right. Right, and I think that I'm not sure if Sister Jean actually actually killed her or allowed her to die, and I think that she allowed her to die. That but was sort of my impression, that she she allowed her to... Well, we probably are giving away. We're spoiling the book. Yeah, sorry. No, no, we don't want to give that away. Well, obviously, there is a debate here, no. <laughs> so it's worth your reading the book to give us right. the final and it's very, But it is very important for the final speech that Sister Jean has mm -hmm. about the nature of her sins. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any reader who reads this book will walk away thinking that Sister Jean sinned. Mm -hmm. But they might, you know. So well, you know, this is the curi her book profiles, as both of you said so so beautifully. The the conflict between good and evil, uh, how doing good can end up bad. Uh -huh. uh, good intentions don't work out the way. And uh, she reminded me of the writer that I did some long study with, Flannery O'Connor, who oh, was also yes. a Catholic, mm -hmm. and uh, but was always pointing out at the almost humorous side of mm -hmm. of the folly of being too good, or mm -hmm. you know that that life somehow trips us up. Yeah. Did did that cross your mind? No, I, I didn't. I can't say that I thought of Flannery O'Connor. Um, I thought of a number of other writers. Well, the, the, he, the kind of falling or humor or... Oh, no, I, I, I think you're right. Yeah. But it, you, it didn't occur to me. It occurred to you, and now that you've said it, I'm like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Well, of course, but I'm always right. That's right. Yeah. But <laughs> while, I was, while I was reading it, um, I was thinking more of some of the postmodernists and how they play around with, oh. with morality issues. Okay, give and us an example. So, um, like uh, Jerzy Kaczynski uh, did a book called Steps, and there are some very graphic, sort of horrific things, but the juxtaposition of one scene against another allows you to come away with a sense of moral ambiguity, because in context, any, any particular horrific act is, is not horrific, but in contrast, it could be. Mm -hmm. And so you get a set of judgments that you bring to the text. Um, more recently, there was a book, um, uh, Where the Crawdads Sing. And uh, Where the Crawdads Sing is also, it's a murder mystery, but it's also sort of a Southern Gothic piece. Mm -hmm. And so when you get to the end, there's this ambiguity about the ethics of who did what and what happened. Mm -hmm. And again, you walk away thinking, okay, yes, a murder was committed, but is that really bad? Was it really yes, was it really an evil act? 
Yeah. Jane, you, you headed a Catholic school. Do you feel that this notion, this constant dance of guilt and sin, good and evil, is You know, we didn't. Book? One and, of the and, nice things about doing that job was I got to design my own program, mm -hmm. and I didn't put any of the church kind of values about Into sin it. or any of those things involved like that in the program for kids. Mm -hmm. We simply didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, and because it was an inner city school, we were able to um, sort of escape notice, mm -hmm. I guess, of the well, diocese. This book is inner city. Of course, it takes right. place in right. Brooklyn, Brooklyn in what, the er, sort of early 20s? Right. You want to say something, Jane? Well, I just thought it was interesting. That, um, the daughter, the, who starts out as a baby in the book, and then grows up and becomes a young woman. And she becomes attracted to the life of the nuns and decides that she wants to be a nun. But it's more for kind of the romance of doing it, you know, than... And, and she finally does go off <laughs> to Chicago and tries, tries her best, but by the time she rides a train with a group of really unpleasant people, and has some difficult experiences that she's simply not used to. She that's, turns that away. really opens her eyes right. to what the real world is like outside. Right. right. She had been oddly the, enough been very very protected despite the poverty right. of Brooklyn. Yeah. And the other part of the book that I thought was so amazing is the nun that runs the laundry in Sister the basement Luminata. of the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's yeah. such a strong part of the book. It's like a uh, whole world takes place in that laundry. That's right. And they don't just launder the nuns' habits and, and bleach and iron and go to great lengths to be sure everything is perfect, but they go through the community collecting uh, people who are sick or have died. They collect bedding mm -hmm. and they do all the heavy washing and ironing of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. return it to people. And in the meantime, there's the baby growing up there in the laundry room, mm -hmm. the mother who comes and goes and, mm -hmm. and is mostly working there, too. Well, there's no question. This book, it's, it's almost blasphemous to try to discuss it in 10 minutes. There's the, the right. themes are so, so thick. That's really pretty ridiculous, wonderful. yes. Yes, it is pretty. I, I plead <laughs> guilty. It's a rich I, book. But well, it's a very rich book. For example, and, the laundry. Mm -hmm. Sister Illuminata is in the laundry because she has tuberculosis, and that's where they put her to isolate her. And so you get this Magdalena laundry thing going on, if you, if you know that history, um, where she's a little bit of an outcast, but she's sacrificing herself, to, as she puts it, to send the clothes back into the world as pure as the, as the, as the uh, rising Christ. Oh, okay. And so you know, she's on her mission, but She's basically an outcast. And then Annie comes in, and Sally comes in, and Sally's raised there. So she's raised to her spirituality by an outcast and by a mother. Well, I won't say what the mother's involved in. But, <laughs> but we you have get the to idea. stop. There we go. I'm sorry. But no, no. I mean, that's it's a good book. This, yeah. <laughs> it, this, is, this is not a beach read. <laughs> no. But it is really a delight in terms of stimulating the little gray cells yes. about good and evil, guilt, sacrifice, love, it's all there. Now, my friends, what we do is we judge this book. We sit in judgment of, on of, this book. Of an, so of, of, if you a book award with it. <laughs> right, that's that's good. If you we did not like the book, it's blue for boo. If you liked the book, it's red for just read it and you're recommending it to others so so Eric you go ahead I, if this is like <laughs> no brainer no brainer no, all right you, but that's a it's absolutely worth the read all right Jane absolutely great well this is a cliffhanger isn't it <laughs> 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 all right uh, ladies and gentlemen thank you for being with us come come back again consider subscribing 
we don't show ourselves very often. We don't sell ads or sell your information. Come back and we'll keep you on the inside with what's the top of the best sellers. And again, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Eric, for a delightful discussion of a fairly grim book. <laughs> oh, I loved it. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> All right. Thank you very, very much.